the tortures of Christ. What type of torture did Jesus really go through on the cross? Here's the highlights. He was tortured physically. He was tortured mentally. He was tortured spiritually. Through the course of this study, we will break down each category of torture and see what that entails. First, let's begin with the most obvious form of torture, that being physical torture. Here is the prophecy of what was to take place. Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, he trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death, for dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and from my clothing, they cast lots. This is some of the actual events that actually took place on the cross. Some of the things mentioned in Psalm 22, we actually see Jesus saying or happening to him. The scripture that says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? He literally says this on the cross, and we'll see that here in a minute. Let's look at Isaiah 50 verse 6. I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. We see that people actually were hitting Jesus in the face, punching him, slapping him, and they were pulling out his beard and spitting on him. Isaiah 52 verse 14. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man in his form more than the sons of men. Visage basically means his face and the, his features, his countenance, his, his appearance. So his face was marred. Now what does marred mean? It means to be damaged, disfigured, scarred. Jesus' face was so damaged, so scarred, it was more so than any man. And people were astonished at it. They were looking at him and so like, whoa, you can't even tell who this guy is. So this brings us to the actual moments before and the time of Jesus' crucifixion. Mark 14 and 65. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to buffet him or attack him and to say unto him, prophesy. And the servants did strike him with the palms of their hands. So as we see, this is direct fulfillment of scripture. Have you ever been hit in the face? I have. It does not feel good. Have you ever been hit in the face more than once? I have. It really doesn't feel good. Actually, after a while from multiple blows to the face, you actually become nauseous. It's not clear how many blows to the face Jesus received, but it is safe to say it was multiple. So you know there was some trauma to his face. Let's go to Matthew 27 and 26. Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on a scarlet robe. And they put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. And after that they had mocked him. They took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. 
So basically, the word scourge here, or to scourge, is a whip or to lash, especially for the infliction of punishment or torture. So he was scourged, he was tortured with whips and lashes. So they tortured Jesus with a whip, lashing him 39 to 41 times, depending on the resource you read. Popular belief shows that it was an instrument the Romans often used called the cat of nine tails. This whip would usually have nine tails branching off the main stem that would have sharp objects put on the ends, which when striking human flesh would rip chunks of flesh off. So imagine approximately 39 lashes of a weapon like this. Then after this was done, the Romans, who were prided in their ruthless tortures, decided to put a scarlet robe on him and a crown of thorns which were jammed into his skull. Then they hit him in the head possibly multiple times. Then they took the robe off of him, which doesn't sound that bad, right? Wrong. His wounds would have basically fused to the robe with his blood drying to it. Once the robe was removed, it would have ripped the wounds open again. Sort of like ripping off a huge band-aid all over your torn fleshed body. Psalm 22 verse 17. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. So after he had got lashed these 39 to 41 times, his bones were exposed. Can you imagine being ripped to a bloody pulp like this, flayed open, being able to observe your bones in your body? Having had no nourishment for many hours and having lost fluids through profuse sweating and much bleeding, Jesus would have been severely dehydrated. This brutal torture would certainly be sending him into what doctors call shock and shock kills. Nevertheless, he endured. He pressed on. He didn't die yet. After Jesus was tortured, then he had to carry the means of his execution with him. Since the execution was a last minute decision, it would make the most sense that Jesus would have had to carry the whole portion of the cross with him. And when I say carry, I mean drag because the weight of the cross would have been a few hundred pounds. Not to mention he had to carry it for quite a long way, roughly half a mile. And he was going uphill at that. It got to be such a burden and such a slow process that the Roman guards made someone else help him carry it. Now here's something many of us don't even think about, but the wood most probably had splinters in it. It wasn't processed at a lumber mill. It was rough cut wood. And Jesus was already wounded so severely from the cat of nine tails that all of his flesh was completely shredded. And I don't know about you, but when I get a splinter, I definitely notice it. Imagine splinters going in already gaping wounds. Not to mention the coarse, hard, heavy wood rubbing up against many of the wounds. Then we come to the actual crucifixion, which if you study this out, you will find that the word excruciating derives from out of the cross. By this point though, it's almost like a mercy kill because Jesus was already running on fumes. Crucifixion is believed to be the worst kind of death that has ever been invented. What was it like? What did Jesus have to endure so that you and I could have eternal life? The worst of all executions. Perhaps the most cruel, vindictive, torturous death anyone at any time in history could have ever experienced was to be crucified. There is nothing that is even remotely close to such a barbaric death penalty as crucifixion was. A firing squad? Huh. Child's play. Lethal injection? Bring it on. Death by electrocution? No problem. None of this compared to crucifixion. While Jesus lay on the cross on the ground, they hammered nails in both his wrists because that would have been the only way to support his own body. Stop right now and touch the veins that are right next to your palms on your wrist. Do you feel how tender that is? 
Now imagine a nail, which is the size of a railroad spike, being driven through both of your wrists. And then imagine your feet being placed one on top of the other, and then another nail being driven through both of the tops of your feet. Once this was finally done, Jesus was raised up and dropped into the hole while attached to the cross. Imagine the impact of all the wounds and what it would feel like once the cross dropped and settled into its place. And if that wasn't bad enough, Jesus would have to push himself up on his wounds to be able to catch a few breaths and then collapse again because of the sheer gut-wrenching pain. Running out of breath, he would have to complete this process for right around six to seven hours while nailed to the cross. Have you ever gone underwater and held your breath as long as you could and then come up gasping for air? Imagine doing that for six to seven hours straight with no breaks while mashed to a bloody pulp and zero energy. But while he was on the cross, he was offered a painkiller of sorts, but he didn't take it. Nowadays, if we get a headache, we moan and groan about it and pop an aspirin or whatever else we might have in our medicine cabinets. But the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords basically said no. I will endure this pain. Let's go back to Psalm 22, 14 and 15. I'm poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. Jesus' knees were flexed at about 45 degrees and he was forced to bear his weight with the muscles of his thigh, which is not an anatomical position which is possible to maintain for more than a few minutes without severe cramp in the muscles of the high thigh and calf. Jesus' weight was borne on his feet with nails driven through them. As the strength of the muscles of Jesus' lower limbs tired, The weight of his body had to be transferred to his wrists, his arms, and his shoulders. Within a few minutes of being placed on the cross, Jesus' shoulders were dislocated. Minutes later, Jesus' elbows and wrists became dislocated. After Jesus' wrists, elbows, and shoulders were dislocated, the weight of his body on his upper limbs caused traction forces on his pectoral major muscles of his chest wall. These traction forces caused his rib cage to be pulled upward and outward in a most unnatural state. His chest wall was permanently in a position of maximum respiratory inspiration in order to exhale. Jesus was physiologically required to force his body, making himself have to breathe. In order to breathe out, Jesus had to push down on the nails in his feet to raise his body and allow his rib cage to move downwards and inwards to expire air from his lungs. And then he finally died. To make sure Jesus was dead, one of the Roman soldiers took a spear and pierced his side, which caused blood mixed with water to flow out of him which I believe signifies Jesus shedding every last drop of blood for us, leaving nothing else. As a matter of fact, doctors know nowadays when this process takes place of the blood mixed with water, that means you've died from asphyxiation. Basically, you've suffocated to death where you couldn't breathe. And as we see, this process was was so hard to breathe to begin with, he finally just gave up and couldn't breathe any longer. He couldn't endure the pain of that, so he just let himself suffocate to death. Now we finally come to mental torture. Hebrews 4, 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. He was tempted in his mind, folks. He had to endure the pain and the stress and the problems of all these things happening to him, just like we would. So let's look at him being stressed. Luke twenty-two forty-four. 44. And this is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. 
there is actual medical contagion where when you get so stressed out that blood can actually seep out of your pores and your sweat bands. Can you imagine being this stressed in this amount of agony? We know that he was praying for three hours. He was praying at least three hours. God, if it can be so, cause this to pass from me. The, your cup of wrath, take it away if it can be so. But he says, nevertheless, not my will be done, but your will. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was thinking about the pain and the torment he was fixing to go through. And this messed with his mind so bad that he started sweating blood. That's some immense stress. And then he asked God, if there's any way you can get me out of this, please help me. And then God the Father let him know right then, you have to go through with this. Man, can you imagine thinking my father is the best? I've already seen his great power. He can deliver me and then being denied. Knowing for a fact you have to go through all this pending torture. Wow, what a mind bomb, right? But even after all that, he basically said, Nevertheless, let your will be done. Now, I do believe that though he was praying, it was as if he was praying in our stead or if it was us in that situation. Because he knew he absolutely had to go to the cross, but yet he prayed as if it were us going through that. And it's our perfect example to see that maybe there's going to come a point in time where you too have to make a hard decision and say, I have to go through with this. God, if you can take it from me, please let it be so. But nevertheless, not my will be done, you will will. And we have to leave it at that. Another factor is he was betrayed. Luke 22, verse 48. Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Jesus was betrayed by one of his 12 apostles. This would be like one of your best friends stabbing you in your back. Even though Jesus knew it was going to happen, it still hurt to watch it unfold. And then to be betrayed by a kiss? A form of affection? That would be like your friend coming up to you and hugging you while letting the bad guys know the one he is hugging is the one they needed to get. Think about that. Man, I know that would sure mess with my mind. Then on top of that, he was deserted. Matthew 26, 56. Then all the disciples left him and fled. How would you feel if your entire posse left you? Man, I can only imagine. Matter of fact, he was despised. Jesus was spit on and mocked and cursed by the very people he came to save. You know that had to mess with his mind, especially with the devil himself right there along the way to ag it on. He was falsely accused by those in the crowd and people of authority. Matthew 26, verse 60. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death, but they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. And then Matthew 27, verse 12. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. I bet everyone knows how it feels to be lied on. Someone making up a story about you, telling others, and it finally gets back to you and you're just like, wow. Really? One time someone was spreading a lie about me and my wife popping pills and I just started laughing because that is so far from the truth. But then after I sat and thought about it, it was sad that someone would lie about me like that. And no telling who believed it because so many people just believe one side of the story and don't bother checking the other side. But people are going to lie, that's just what people do. But you know that had to get to Jesus at least a little bit. He was traded for a murderer. Pilate gave the people the choice to either let Jesus go or Barabbas, who was a murderer, and they chose to let the murderer go. That would be like somebody today saying, okay, we can either let Charles Manson go or Jesus. And everybody said, let Charles Manson go. See, when you put a name to it that you know, it sheds a whole new light on it, doesn't it? So you gotta know Jesus was being attacked in his mind over that as well. Lastly, his mom was there watching. Can you imagine thinking of your loved one having to endure seeing you like that? John 19, 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. 
So his own mother was sitting there watching him have to, having to be tortured. And Jesus had to sit there and look at the torment in her, his mother's eyes and see her crying and, and not able to do a single thing about it. Our final point is spiritual torture. Matthew 26, 37 and 38. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. Jesus admits that his soul or his very spirit is exceedingly sorrowful even unto death, meaning he could just die at any moment just from being so upset. Man, that is some spiritual torture right there, feeling like that. Man, kind of makes your blue Mondays not so blue, doesn't it? Matthew 27 and 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? We see when Jesus is on the cross, he cries to his father and says, why have you forsaken me? And we understand that because of the sin of the world being cast upon Jesus, God the Father had to forsake him at least for this period of time because God cannot behold sin. God cannot be a part of sin. So Jesus was spiritually perplexed and dismayed, literally feeling what it feels like to be abandoned and disconnected from his Father. And this feeling had never been felt in Jesus because since his birth, his heavenly Father had been a part of his life. Never knowing sin, Jesus had a perfect connection with his Father. And now for this period in time, he had to be without that connection. What a dark time it was for Jesus. And in conclusion, although Jesus had the power of a God, he laid that down in order to be like us. In other words, it would be like Superman giving up his powers to be a human. Although the Father did use Jesus to perform many miracles, but he became like us in order to die for us, to give God the perfect sacrifice for our sin and to bring us a better connection to God once again. He also lived for us in order to show us the way to be our ultimate example in everything. Through the course of the study, I came across a few places where people said Jesus didn't suffer as bad as some other people. And it just made me awestruck to think that some people don't think Jesus suffered bad enough. I mean, my goodness, look at the things mentioned and tell me he didn't suffer really bad. Also, I want to encourage anyone who has never seen The Passion of the Christ, I suggest that you watch it. I think it would probably be the closest visual aid we have to understanding at least some of what it must have been like for Jesus. Most of the pictures listed here are from the movie, The Passion of Christ. I hope that you got something good from the study, and I pray that you really can appreciate this Good Friday. God bless you.